Yeah, as you can see, we're getting ready. Let's, let's head into the shop. We'll have to convert it into the lab, but I've got some things with me today that I need to share with you. I got a peach, let me see, I got apple, I got blue, I got some other stuff too. We're gonna talk all about flavoring. Everything, we're gonna try to hit everything from A to Z. Come on, come on in. Oh yes, the sort of topic of flavoring. That's what today's topic is going to be about. And we're gonna to try to touch on all the bases so that we all have a thorough and firm understanding about how to flavor, about what flavors are better, what flavors are more concentrated, what or some that we keep chasing, but we just can't seem to get there. Uh, we're going to cover all that today. Welcome to Barley and Hops. Yes, I'm George, and this is the channel that dares to unlock the mysteries of home distilling. We welcome all of you home distillers, beer brewers, winemakers. It doesn't matter what your hobby is. We cover science, principles, theoretical aspects of this hobby which kind of touch all of the sciences and yes we're here today for another one we're going to talk about flavoring yes that sorted term and topic that tends to elude a lot of people but before i get there i just want to please bear with me for about oh about a minute and 30 seconds i got to show you this a viewer sent in a video a uh, there's no, there's no better way to explain it than to just show it to you. Watch this. Hi, George. Uh, just thought I'd check in with you, give you an update on um, my still now that uh, I've updated it slightly. Uh, inside here, we've got a, a 300mm uh, twin helix coil. The bubble plates are the update and I've modified the water system slightly. This is the feed for the Liebig condensers and obviously the feed for the cold feed for the, uh, the coil. This is a flow meter which goes through up to here. This box obviously you recognize I've found uh, all the information off your videos and many thanks for that. Um, I've added the flow meter just to keep an eye on um, how, how much water is going through the coil. This is currently coming off uh, at about 95, 96. Very happy with so that. So there you have it. That's just pure. That's awesome. So, and, and, and I thank you so very much for sending that in and sharing that with me so that I can share that with all of you. Now, on to why we're here. Oh, God, I love that. Um, we, now we've got all of these flavors and remember we talk about flavor that normally takes place after distillation. Now there are some flavorings that take place during the distillation process, but this is where we have that, it's not even a fine line, it's a very, very direct difference between uh, flavoring inside a still and flavoring after distillation, okay? Um, and let me try. Let me try to capture this in a way that that really makes sense. Um, and and that is, all too often we'll have someone they'll say, "Here's an apple," and I brought this apple as an ex as an example. And we know that an apple has a delicious flavor, but unfortunately, we sometimes tend to think that well, if I crush up a bunch of apples, and then I just and I ferment the apples, and then I distill it that my distillate's going to come out and taste like this delicious apple. Well, that's, as we know from experience, that's not necessarily true. And why is that? Well, that it's simply it's because we're going to separate, once we ferment, we have the alcohol, we're going to have an apple character in that alcohol, all right? 
not necessarily that robust flavor that you find in the apple because that's been separated but the character is there wow this is this is a hard one to, to try to overcome if you've fermented apples and distilled it trust me and i did it with you remember i did it with my sweet potato vodka and remember you can remember when i did that and i tasted it, i went yep i know that because i made it out of sweet potatoes I can convince myself that, yes, it's, I've got that little hint of sweet potato. But if you give that to someone blindly, um, there's no way they're going to pull out and go, oh, that's, that's a sweet potato vodka. And, and I understand that. Uh, you should understand that as well. The same thing with distilling apples. Um, you give that to someone else, and if you do it, of course, you're going to pick up that hint, that character of apple. Now, here's the good part about that, is if you distill apples ferment and then distilled apples, and you add an apple flavor to it, it's much more enhanced as and or more pronounced. Hmm. Uh, it begs the question. Well, I mean, of course, I know we've got apple pie moonshine, um, which is a real, real favorite, and that's really nothing more than a good moonshine. Um, and, you know, you use apple juice, apple cider, some cinnamon, star anise, and some brown sugar, you kind of boil that up, you mix it together, and it makes a great apple pie moonshine. We all love that because of its flavor profile, okay? But the problem is, is that a lot of folks think that you can just distill apples, it's going to come out tasting like apples. See, we have the same challenge with, and we all know the luscious, lovely peach, okay? Uh, peaches have a really wonderful flavor, and this is really a popular flavor in a liqueur, uh, in a vodka, or in in a moonshine. People love the peach flavor. I made the peach brandy and we did the, the video. And you recall that we fermented uh, canned peaches and I reserved several cans with the juice so that after distillation, knowing that I had a character spirit of peach, it wasn't going to taste exactly like a peach. And I used the syrup in the reserved cans to cut it so that I would have that peach flavor, okay? Now, of course, you're only gonna to get to a certain level of flavor profile, even in doing it that way. Remember, you're not going to be able to ferment enough. There is not enough flavor in a peach or in, a, or in an apple uh, in order to carry that over through a distillate. And that's well understood. Even our commercial distilleries understand that. Uh, if you went and bought a bottle of orange vodka, uh, do you think that it was just distilled oranges and it comes out tasting like oranges? Well, absolutely not. It's been treated, flavored. It has additives in order to give it that flavor. Now, the TTB here in the United States, which controls all alcohol and labeling and production and, oh my goodness, if you start reading that law and th those regulations that refer to that, you are in for a long read. Uh, they definitely have their claws into just about everything. And there's probably a good reason for most of it. Maybe not all of it, but, but most of it. Um, but there, there are uh, parts per million um, allowable additions into a spirit before you have to call it either natural or artificial flavored. You, you see where I'm going with that. So um, if you pick up a bottle of, uh, let's say, peach vodka, um, it wasn't just distilled peaches. That was, you've got to understand that. That was treated. Okay, uh, oh, I've got some, another one, a wonderful blueberry. People love blueberries. They love the blueberry flavor. There is a way to get the blueberry flavor. Yes, of course. George, you're rambling on, and I know that. Um, there are some things out there that we are accustomed to and familiar with. I have several of them right here. Uh, here's a coconut mint additive. Uh, and these are the essences. Uh, here I got a spiced rum. Um, and here's a Jamaican rum. Now, what are these good for? Uh, they're good for the 750 milliliter bottle, you know, or a quart. Uh, it, you just, you have your own rum your base rum product and you can add these rum ones in there spiced rum or the jamaican rum uh, and you mix one of these in there and it 
gives it that flavor, that color, that mystique, that character, kind of builds on it. Um, and then here's the same thing for the coconut mint liqueur. You can do the same thing. Now, there are ways in order to get more flavor in a spirit that we are also familiar with. Let's talk about gin. We know that gin is, if you don't know, gin is made, the primary, the base gin is made by distilling either through juniper berries or infusing, which is to just soak. All right? So you can soak a spirit uh, with uh, juniper berries and get that juniper berry flavor, which would gives you, gives you the base product of a gin, or you distill through them. Now, the major difference is, keep this in mind, these are small berries, but they are so packed full of a flavor uh, and they are so concentrated that they do last a long time. So it takes, in a five gallon batch, I'd probably put like 30 berries in a gin basket. Oh, by the way, they make those. Uh, that, there go the term, gin basket. You can add spices, and this is a spice. Um, and therefore, you can flavor that spirit as it comes out. Okay? But be forewarned, because I know of folks who have tried this. No, you cannot put enough strawberries in a gin basket. You cannot have a gin basket big enough to put enough strawberries in it in order to carry that strawberry flavor over to the spirit. It's not impossible. It's virtually impossible because the strawberry does not have that compact, complex flavor profile in a small area. As soon as you start to distill through a strawberry, the first couple drops have a little bit of a strawberry aroma to them and flavor and then all of a sudden if you if you can see them the strawberries turn white boom they're gone all the flavors gone there's only so much flavor in there and you just can't seem to pack enough in there in order to do that same thing with banana same thing with peach same thing with apples um, it, it just the flavor is gone almost immediately um, another addition in a column which I tend to I really like myself uh, coffee beans uh, I've taken Kona coffee um, and do the same thing, put them in a gin basket. And this takes probably about 40 or 50 beans. Um, and you just all you have to do is crack them. Don't crush them, just crack them uh, and put them in the column and distill through it. You get this wonderful aroma. You get this coffee profile. You get this coffee flavor. Uh, so at the, while you're having a couple of drinks, you feel like you're waking up and getting drunk at the same time. It's, you know, go figure out. I like the flavor. Um, different people have different palates, and they tend to like that, and I do that on occasion. Um, now, we know we have, I have a Madagascar um, vanilla bean. And we know that a Madagascar or any vanilla bean has a really, really high compact concentration of flavors inside the bean. Um, and you can use those in a column as well. Just slice the bean down the side so that you can access the inside of the bean while the vapors are passing through and they'll pick up that flavor. Uh, these last a rather long time as well. They don't dissipate quickly like a swoops, like a strawberry or a blueberry would or an apple or an orange or a, I mean all those other you, you see you, you can normally tell um, the level of, of, um, of flavor and the, the consistency and the compactness of the flavor by what happens when you put one in your mouth or something in your mouth. Uh, and that is, if you can't get rid of that flavor out of your mouth, um, it's probably got a high concentration of that flavor. Um, if once you bite into it and swallow it and it's gone, it, if there's no real strong residual flavor left, chances are you're not going to be able to distill through that and drag that into the distillate. Fair? Okay, fair enough. Now, one thing that I do have to offer you, though, is there are ways about this. Now, distilleries, commercial processes, um, if walk into a liquor store and just to start look at the display um, and the variety of flavors that are available in your gins, your vodkas, and in some of your whiskeys, okay? And it ranges everywhere from mint to peach to cherry to lemon to orange, oh my goodness, to maple. That There are so many flavors available, 
and those are all additives. Um, now, the, a lot in whiskeys in particular, that part of that is the aging process, and how that's actually conducted, where some of those flavors are imparted based on the aging process, but almost in every case there is an addition of something additional in order to bring out or enhance those flavors. And we have such a we have such a product here today. Okay. Catch out the bag. Um, we have extracts. Now there's a difference between an extract and a flavor. Um, and the, the concentration of that uh, is totally different between a flavor and an extract. Uh, when you have an extract, you have actually in a chemical process, they've removed the flavor and they've concentrated it into an extract that you can use in foods and different things. Now, Olive Nation, um, and yes, they sent these to me, um, and I've tested many different, many different companies, and there are some others that are, are, are equally as good. Um, Olive Nation just seems to be a little bit more on the cutting edge, in my opinion. Um, and they offer these in gallons or large, huge gallons or, or, or huge volumes um, as they provide these products to commercial distilleries and, 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 and other industries as well. Um, and what I'll tell you is that I've got this collection of flavors here and aromas. I mean, right now I'm overwhelmed because the stuff is so concentrated. If you get a little drop on the outside, you'll smell it forever. Um, I use these small pipettes, and this is a pipette droplet dropper, um, and they're made out of plastic. You get like two, three hundred of them in a bag for a couple of bucks on Amazon. Uh, and they're measured in millimeters, or I'm sorry, in milliliters. And in each one of these, what I did was I took 50 milliliters of sp some 80 proof spirit, and in this particular case, happened to be my sweet potato vodka, and I added a half a milliliter of the extract in there, and that kind of across the board kind of worked as far as the ratio is concerned. So it was a half a milliliter to 50, so that's one milliliter to 100. So the ratio is one to 100. Um, so that's quite a bit because there is 100, and if I'm not mistaken, there's 118. Yeah, 118.29 milliliters or four fluid ounces here. So you've got quite a bit to go quite a ways. Um, the first one that I actually did, where is it? Here it is, is I was interested and curious about how to replicate and or enhance peach. Um, and there we go. There's my peach. And so a half a milliliter. Uh, into the peach and of course we don't have taste of vision or smell of vision so you just got to take my word for it but this is one of those once you taste it well you smell it and you're like whoa and then you taste it and the first thing out of your mouth is going to be ah, that's a peach that's peach um, it's got a really really good flavor profile there are others here blueberry I was able to do the same thing for blueberries and they've got a long list of these on their website and that's olive day i just type in olivenation.com um and i've got a pure, pure coconut extract same results watermelon same results how nice is it to have watermelon right a really good watermelon shine um the maple extract happens to be one that is really good you got that maple flavor and that maple aroma but it's not clear uh so this would really be good in a in a whiskey or a bourbon uh, to give it that maple background, you know, that you're looking for. <laughs> there, there are so many options available with that. Here's one called Coconut Candy. Now, for the life of me, I'm not quite sure why you would use cotton candy uh, extract uh, in a spirit, but I did. And when I took a taste of it, I thought I was back at, yep, back at the amusement park eating a cotton candy. Um, that one's probably more designed for cakes and things like that. Uh, so I'll set, I'll set that one aside. And yes, we have chocolate as well. Um, and hazelnut, great for coffees or whatever your desires are. And last but not least, yes, the, the natural apple. Uh, now, uh, I wanted to share with you too that 
apples in themselves. Um, this is actually another topic, but I'll hit it real quick. This is a Fuji, and a Fuji just happens to be, you know, apples are listed as sweet, sweetest sweet, sweet tart, tart, and sour. And this falls on that end of that category as sweet, the, like one of the sweetest apples on the market. Well, there you have it. Uh, each and every one of these, small pippets, or look, if you're going to use a spoon, and trust me, if you get one of these, you're going to try it. You're going to use a spoon. You're going to get that stuff somewhere that it ain't supposed to be, and you'll smell it for the rest of the day. It's not that bad. I mean, it's not unpleasant, but my point is, is get a couple of these. They're really easy to use. You squeeze it, suck up a little bit, get the right amount, and then pop it in there. Um, it's going to save you a whole lot of trouble later on trying to get it off your hands because you'll walk around smelling peach all day on your hand or maple uh, it's just one of those things so what we've covered is flavorings remember most flavoring happens after distillation almost all specific flavorings happen after distillation oh distilling a fruit will carry a character of that product but does not carry the flavor through to the distillate as we would anticipate it's just one of those things we have to accept going in. There are flavors in a distillate that are desirable and that come from the actual distillation process, that being the corn, the rye, the barley, the base, and or distilling through a product like a gin, juniper berries, coffee, things of that nature. Um, those are ways to get a flavor into the distillate on the other end. But... You've got to be able to make the distillate properly first. So go back and watch the videos. Get good at distilling in order to get a quality product because uh, there's no sense in wasting time trying to flavor. You cannot flavor or you cannot disguise a bad distillate with a flavor. It'll just taste like a bad distillate that's flavored. Okay? Uh, I often say that. I get questions, George. It, I, it comes out and it's burnt. What can I do to fix it? Until you can figure out how to unfry an egg, you're kind of stuck. So um, if it's burnt, it's burnt. You know, you know, that's, that's all you can do. If it's tails and you can taste the tails, you can rerun it to try to clean it up and leave the tails back in the still. But now you've gone and done it twice when you should have done it first, right the first time. In any event, remember, a quality product on the end and then flavoring will make you happy, happy, happy. Happy distilling.